Hello. Over the years, there have been many influential artists, writers, designers, and business leaders who have charted the course of 40k, Warhammer Fantasy, Age of Sigmar, and indeed Games Workshop as a whole. Amongst those individuals, there are plenty of famous names, but there have long been those who have steered the course from behind the scenes, supporting creatives and influencing decisions. This is my interview with one such important figure, who worked at Games Workshop for 36 years, from the very earliest days of Citadel to the very end times of Warhammer Fantasy, who Black Library described as being one of the driving forces for Games Workshop's imagery, and who, in his final role for the company, was responsible for the IPs of Warhammer Fantasy and 40k. I'm Jordan, this is Jordan Sorcery, and today I'm in conversation with Alan Merritt. Alan, thank you so much for joining me to have a bit of a chat about your time at Games Workshop over the years. I wonder if we might start with maybe even a bit of a potted history of, of your time at Games Workshop, because you started in the in the quite early days at Citadel, is that right? Yes, hi. Uh, that's quite correct, Sir Jordan. I joined um, the very fledgling Citadel miniatures in, in 1980. Um, and at that time, uh, Citadel was a partnership that was uh, between Brian Ansell, if you really remember, and Steve Jackson and Ian Livingstone, who happened to be the owners of Games Workshop at the time, which was also a very small, fledgling business, although it had already acquired a massively important reputation in, in the UK because it was the importer of Dungeons and Dragons to the UK. And so just on that basis alone, um, it was enjoying a, a very high degree of, of, of uh, media attention for a tiny little hobby company and, um, and was also shaking up the UK gaming scene quite, quite remarkably. Um, so I think that Citadel had about six employees when I joined. <laughs> and, um, and my job was to sit in front of the casting machine and empty molds, basically stri stripping, opening up the molds and taking out the little metal figures. Um, and my responsibilities grew over the, the weeks, the first weeks into being allowed to actually um, operate the machine, turn it on and off and feed it with metal ingots and things. and and Eventually, I got to do um, hand casting and all kinds of interesting things. I learned all about how to make white metal figures. Um, uh, Brian was very much the boss. He was very much hands-on chap at the time. Um, and we used to have daily chats about all kinds of things. Very, very little of those chats were about actually the business they were mostly about music or concerts or um, he was convinced I looked like Graham Parker from Graham Parker in the room and so he assumed that I was a huge fan which I was coincidentally <laughs> <laughs> so it was kind of a uh, relaxed I never for a moment thought that the job would last more than a few months it was a, a tied me over um my my actual ambition was to um go back into further education, do some more um, exams, and then go to um, university, or go back to university, because um, I'd left the previous summer. Um, but that never happened. I just sort of stayed there. Um, the business grew. We were, it was reasonably successful. I was a, a, just a, a caster. Um, but then one day, my the guy who was my supervisor came into the casting room and said, oh, I'm leaving. And uh, I said, oh, surprised. He said, he said yeah, I'll, I'm off. I won't be in on, mon on Monday. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. so there I there was casting miniatures in this little room and wondering who my who my, my next supervisor would be when Brian turns up and he says, oh, do you want, do you want his job? I was like, "All oh, right, okay, yes, please." <laughs> so I, I got to be the uh, I got to be the uh, Brian's two CI for a, for a brief moment in time, uh, and 
and that widened my eyes to a, sort of broader issues to do with the Citadel business, um, like uh, having to um, fill out orders and talk to people on the phone about their order and organise people to not only cast the miniatures, but to pack the miniatures and make the moulds. And so I learned a bit about mould making and, and um, that became my kind of, um, my role for the next uh, uh, two or three years. As the company uh, grew, uh, we merged with Games Workshop. What really happened was that Brian sort of sold his, dissolved the partnership because he wanted to do other things. Um, and, and he went away briefly for about a year to do other things. Um, so I became a Games Workshop employee by default. <laughs> uh, Stephen Ian. Um, came up to, to um, the Citadel factory, which was in a completely different part of the UK from Games Workshop. We were in a little town called Newark on Trent, mm -hmm. uh, which is in Nottinghamshire. It's near, quite close to Nottingham, but um, we're very long away from London. And, uh, but one day, uh, Steve Jackson and Neil Livingstone came up to the, the factory, which was pretty unusual to, um, basically asked me how I felt about Brian. <laughs> I said, well, he was a really great, great boss. And he knew what he was doing. He understood toy soldiers. And um, uh, if only we had someone like Brian running the business, we would be successful again at selling <laughs> toy soldiers. And then so they, um, and that was part of the process of them rehiring Brian um, as the general manager. And that, moment when Brian came back to Citadel was pr probably when um, things really changed. And in my mind, it went from being a temporary job I was doing to tide me over into being actually a real job hmm. because uh, um, Brian, Brian's energy and his ideas and his creativity and his forceful personality, put it that way, um, Drove it's like driving us to, to massive success. We were we were um, doubling the turnover every couple of weeks, every every month or so. It was a new record level of sales. We were doing exciting things with product ranges. Um, it was good fun actually. <laughs> it was it was it was like a it was like a uh, every day was exciting, energetic, and and. Uh, very cooperative as well. Um, so lots of uh, ideas about how moulds were made, how miniatures were designed, how ranges were packaged, how we marketed things. The growing group of us in, the, in at the centre of it um, had a huge sort of part to play in a lot of those decisions and a lot of that, a lot of that movement. Even though it was Brian, it was Brian's final say so um because he was the boss um and that really that period including the move to um the eastwood factory um probably cemented brian's reputation as a uh, an effective manager of a of, of a reasonably sized business so mm -hmm. such that when Steve and Ian said, oh, we want to take a step back, Brian was the obvious candidate to, to manage the Games Workshop business for them. Um, but Brian had bigger ambitions, um, organised a management buyout um, where he bought Games Workshop from, well, he bought a majority stake in the company and uh, became the I suppose he would have been the, the chief exec then, but I don't think we ever called him that. I think he was just Brian <laughs> <laughs> or boss, mostly. <laughs> sure. um, and that that um, that period then was super exciting. We moved Games Workshop's operation up to Eastwood, consolidated a lot of the back back office um, and uh, warehousing and. Um, all the print buying um, duties all became consolidated. 
um, which stripped a lot of cost out of the business, um, uh, which was good for Brian uh, was it? Um, and good good for us. We were all uh, enjoying the fruits of that success mm. in different ways. Um, yeah, and that was uh, again a very a, not wholly. Um, uh, it wasn't a party every day. It was work. Um, we had immense challenges some of them were quite ludicrous actually totally left field weird things um uh can i tell you this story i think i can tell you this story one day somebody somebody turned up at the the factory in in eastwood and um or 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 i i can't remember exactly how it went but but we got i've got i've got a feeling i might have been phoned at sort of one o'clock in the morning, I was in bed and I think the phone rang and um, and I think it was Diane Lane, who was Brian's partner and general sort of head of ad- admin. And she said, oh, you need to get to the factory um, immediately. Uh, and we've got a problem. And, uh, so imagine driving across Nottinghamshire to get to this factory. <laughs> In the, in the dead of night and apparently we'd we'd had a notification that our, the metal we were using for casting uh, was radioactive <laughs> wow and that we and so we had this emergency meeting trying to figure out what on earth we were going to do um given that you know if if we had been selling radioactive miniatures that might be a, <laughs> that might be a, a little of a pr in <laughs> Um, problem but more importantly how on earth were we going to survive if we couldn't make miniatures mm. um and that was a very fraught fraught uh, weekend uh when it transpired it was all rubbish it was completely unfounded and, it, and nothing came of it but it was strange things like that happened quite often yeah i'll bet <laughs> i mean what, what was your role at that time then so were you, were you still in the casting rooms or had you sort of taken on other responsibilities by that point i think, I think technically i was the factory manager one right. of the things about one of the things about working for a, a small business even even a successful one is that you, you you're, you're a bit of a jack of all trades so you, you end up learning and doing a bit of everything and then you sort of gravitate towards things that you seem to more successful at handling than than other people or that you make less mistakes at handling than other people would so i kind of ended up being the sort of the factory manager for a period um and that basically meant i was in charge of mold making and casting and packing and stock and order fulfillment all, all fell into my kind of overall remit um and then we had departments like mail order that would be in the warehouse that although i technically didn't have line manager responsibility for they were in my warehouse (laughs) right um and it's my stock (laughs) so (laughs) so there's lots of crossover and lots of lots of blurred areas but the one thing that i was doing at that time was um and and i've been doing for for um a couple of years was I was to, to handling all the sculpting. And the reason I was handling the sculpting is because I was, at one stage, I was one of only two people, including Brian, in the business who could make a master mold. Because um, that used to be Brian's job. He was, Brian was a superb craftsman. He was very good at um, uh, making things and uh, brilliant with his hands um, and he taught me how to make master molds where you were really taking the original very delicate mm. um, putty masters and uh, making a mold of them without utterly destroying them <laughs> in the process um, and uh, I had an aptitude for that work so i became the master mold maker and as a result of that i became the kind of the link between the sculptors who were all living and working remotely from the factory and um and and the business and the process right um so uh, i was also so 
as factory manager, I was also kind of miniatures manager at that point as well. Again, the 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 the, the um, so I was telling the miniatures the miniatures designers what to make. Right. Um, of course, I had to make sure that that was okay with Brian. And whenever they visited the factory or came to see the factory, it would always be Brian they would see because um, we treated them very um, very carefully. They were a unique and special resource and very uh, very highly valued. Um, so we it was fine to have the illusion that Brian was still their boss <laughs> and telling them what to do. So, so I was I was merely passing on orders to Brian because I was mostly having to make all these because he was off doing important other stuff. <laughs> so, what would have but, been the sort of main product lines that you were producing at that point? Oh crikey! Um, obviously, Warhammer um, was the big one. We only just started to do forty k, mm. but not in any meaningful way. We've made limited edition Space Marine model, which was quite yeah. a interesting job um and a few other things but there were all kinds of ranges um lots of license license ranges doctor who middle earth uh, uh, various um weird and strange things <laughs> i mean because it was and there was quite a there was a real creativity of like just trying lots of different things for those Warhammer and Rogue Trader lines and, and others. What was sort of influencing your decisions in in ha like let's try making this or let's do a an army or a unit of these guys? How how were those decisions getting made? Well, a lot of it was to do with the the um, the, uh, the, the, the the overall context. I mean, Warhammer was uh, anything, any and all things fan fantasy. Um, and was started off being basically we have lots and lots of fantasy models and we've created a game um, that uses sort of generic fantasy models, you know. Um, and so quite a lot of the early um, C ranges, for example, were all just um, how many different ideas do we have for an orc? Let's whack mm. them in. Oh, what can we do with dwarfs? And and some of the ranges had had. Uh, very offbeat and um, strange little little miniatures in them for different reasons. <laughs> so a dwarf, I think the dwarf range had had a big game hunter, a dwarf right. pit on it, and a blunderbuss, and things like that. You know, it was it was um, it was weird and exciting. So we had this bedrock of of make fantasy figures. Um, there were certain um, subjects that were I, we knew would be more successful sales wise than others and so we were i was constantly looking for opportunities to have more of those made um we always had far too many goblins for reasons um, um but we never had enough chaos warriors mm. for reasons um and so part of the my job was thinking about who which sculptors had had aptitudes for which ranges and um there's a a simple rule of thumb if the designer's not excited about working on a, on a miniature then there's no point having working on that miniature mm. they have to be in they have to be invested they have to be excited about it, the and and have some sort of empathy with the with the design or the or the ideas of it and so and you get to know those things um quite quickly really you get to know what particular designers like and what and and what they and what and what subjects they excel at, and then you just try and match those together mm. with a some kind of commercial imperative. Um, I, I in the in the eyes of Brian, most weeks I failed, so I didn't come and say, "Why are you having so and so make these?" And um, well, don't you know we need more of these other things? I go, yes, Brian, but this that and the other. Thing. I go, All right. Why don't you get so and so to make loads of these? And I go and get. That designed to make those things, and then Brian would say, "Why did you do that? <laughs> we can't sell anything." So it was a a lot of it was about balancing expectations, both within and without. That has never changed. That that's mm. never ever ever changed. And I suppose it's probably still happening today in Games Workshop. Um, the uh, so uh, it's it's 
it's creativity within within a context. Now, some designers would just full on completely embrace it. Um, actually, um, come back with complete filled out backgrounds and ideas for them. And it's just Jez Goodwin is particularly was particularly um, uh, good at that. So he wouldn't just design miniatures; he'd, he'd actually tell you exactly the histories and the gods of these miniatures and how they interacted with each other and all sorts of stuff. And oh, and these are the things they put on their shields and um, very, very um, deeply involved and invested in, in what he was doing. Other designers were just more like brilliant sculptors and brilliant designers and do fantastic miniatures, but it was ooh, ooh, not one of those out and off we go again. Um, and, and they all had their place and all had their value, but um, a constant juggling act really uh, that never got easier as, as the years went on yeah because i imagine there is that tension between the the creativity and then the, the sort of commerciality of a given range or game and sort of trying to balance that out of well we really would love to do this because people are super passionate in the business about it but we don't know if it will sell yeah that's absolutely right um and, it, and then um you have to imagine that there's there's um, an, an internal market. The bigger the company got, um, the more uh, organised that presentation to the internal market had to become. Right. Uh, so uh, the internal marketing, in other words, um, persuading the sales companies that this was really a good product and that they would be able to sell it was a was a constant pressure on the design process um absolutely completely shapes it um so it, you, you can there is a mythology that circulates around the fandom um which is um it's the great. It's a great. It's, yeah, it it kind of goes like this. Oh, Games Workshop used to be great when it was by hobbyists for hobbyists. You know, when it wasn't a business that was being driven by um, tawdry commercial imperatives. And I go, hmm, I wonder what day that was because in all the years I was there, that was the main driving force for the business. Was is this commercial? Can we sell it? Um, we didn't do anything that we didn't think we was we didn't think was commercial but obviously you you have higher expectations for some things than others but but we never willingly put any effort into anything we thought wouldn't sell or was just being done for um as a sort of a as a um as a frippery or as a personal sop, sop to, to somebody Mm. Uh, e even some of the most deeply uncommercial things we did we, we didn't know they were at the time <laughs> <laughs> but but in a in, a, in any kind of um publishing uh, venture where you're taking uh, thoughts ethereal concepts and you're turning them into product whether that's a piece of written prose uh, a game mechanic a piece of artwork a miniature, a kit, anything, a piece of music. Whenever you're involved in any endeavour like that, even if it's got a commercial outcome, you want to do something that sells that's, and, and, and is liked by people, you, you have to um, get the people that are creating the thing engaged. They have to feel creative. You have to build an environment where they're, where they can be creative, where they're not the ones that are worrying about those commercial imperatives, you take take that away from them, so they can they can just design or create in in a space that feels um, encouraging and productive in that way. So a lot of a lot of the job is to take away those commercial pressures from designers and writers and such like. You say worry about that aspect you worry about the things you control uh, so that yeah but i don't think we ever i don't think games workshop ever really was by hobbyists for hobbyists it was always 
by hobbyists for commercial success. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, the, and the, the sort of story goes with certain passion projects that like, like the realm of chaos and, and the orc books for 40k of course yeah absolutely um that they were sort of really driven by okay so brian's really super invested in these and wants to tell these particular stories did, did was that true for those kinds of books with i mean there must have still been a commercial aspect to that decision as yeah. well oh I, I think so yeah um uh brian had a had a very um, strong view about um, printed product, um, particularly, and he wanted the he wanted us to produce um, gem like products with incredible quality and um, a, a, a very high degree of, of finish and and and. Um, and a depth and a gravitas to them. That was, and and he wanted us to make that kind of product because he thought that kind of product would be successful, would be commercially successful. Hmm. Um, there was a lot of very um, hurriedly produced, very um, and and cheaply uh, produced. Um, gaming product around the, the history of wargaming rules in 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 the world was that they were usually you know um, very very cheaply produced and sold for a, a half a tanner you know that's an old English coin that's worth about five, five cents in American terms you know so um, the, the 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 world of wargaming the world of toy soldiers the worlds of, of hobby gaming were um, not exactly um, uh, famed for the quality of the of the literature that associated with them. Mm. Um, and Brian just thought that you know that the books should have those qualities. Those were the things he liked, and he, he did have very strong commercial instincts. Um, and the problem. It is is that those products are even more terrifyingly difficult to produce than the simple thirty-two page RPG modules, which we found very hard to produce anyway. You know, we we invest vast amounts of time and resource in in those products, and um, and we didn't get the we didn't get the immediate sales that all that investment we needed to, to make it sensible. Mm. Um, but that was, that was, those were, were, it was absolutely a commercial decision and borne out really by the long-term um, success of, of all of the products, um, you know, um, they have outlasted, um, those investments they just weren't returning them very quickly sure yeah <laughs> yeah i mean you can still buy copies of uh realm of chaos uh they're, they're reprinting they're yeah reprinting. absolutely <laughs> yeah <laughs> within <bonkers>. the <laughs> and i guess it does speak to absolutely that the longevity of the decision the decision was a good one in terms of you know if your if your time horizon for returns and the profits are over 30 or 40 years instead of a couple of years, then it's very successful in that <laughs> regard. But as yeah. the company moved sort of beyond Brian Ansell, and a, a lot of that stuff was kind of put to one side almost, wasn't it? With the like the the GW books, the fiction line, the uh, flame publications and the RPG modules for, for Wolfrop. And then there was a real concentration on the sort of core games and the miniatures again. Is that fair to say? Yes. Yes. Well, um, after the launch of 40k, which completely transformed the the, the company, um, in, in, um, that's an exciting period. Um, so, the the process of creating 40k was um, tortuous and um, only involved a very tiny number of people because it was never thought it was going to be quite the the success it ended up being um the, the bulk of the 
early work was was Rick Priestley sitting in a it may, may even been at home quite a lot of the time, but in a in a lonely office, the door locked, just bashing away at keys, grumbling a lot about how narrow the brief was <laughs> because because Brian had given him a very a very specific brief. It must include every model that we have with a gun in our range. In cases. <laughs> Well, including all the Doctor Who range, yes, including them. Whoops, <laughs> um, you know, yeah. So, uh, uh, cle clever students will find the reference to Daleks in the original um, 40k book, but um, it's quite subtle, or maybe not, depending on your investigative powers. Um, but uh, yeah, no. So, um, Rick beavered away on the on the, on the manuscript, um, and as it slowly turned into a thing that we actually were going to publish. We, we play tested it. Um, it, it was, um, so small group of people were involved in play testing 40k. Um, exploratory artwork was created and then it kind of built momentum but only within the studio or um, most of the artwork was commissioned from freelance artists because we didn't employ any um, internal artists other than John Blanche and Tony Ackland. And they did a bit of work on it, but they were mostly working on or, on the other th things as well. <laughs> so a great mass of the art in, in 40K was, was generated outside of the studio. Um, and then we had to put the pull this book together and it was all um kind of um i would say under resourced because we did put a lot of effort into it um but there was no great there was no great massive plan <laughs> for it um it was all, all us trying things out yeah. so we would so um and i'll give you an example of that so brian wasn't very happy in, in, engaged in us designing huge ranges of science fiction models. So part of the plan was that we would, um, people would convert fantasy models. So let's make packs of guns and uh, blasters and things and cannons and cast them up as weapon packs and then sell them. And then people can just convert their orcs, cut, cut the ax off and stick a gun there. Same with their elves and skavens and all, however, you know, chaos warriors. Chaos Warrior with a gun is the science fiction evil bad guy. <laughs> I don't know. So there was a there was an idea that um, that we wouldn't invest a lot in the in the miniatures, and then of course people say to me, "Oh yeah, but RTBO one the um, the famous uh, box of plastic space marines that wouldn't have been a casual design or or product in idea." And it, no, it wasn't, but it was really a test of a, a um, plastic tooling um, idea that we had to try and make plastic tooling a bit more uh, uh, doable because it was the plastic tools were super expensive. And so the that original Space Marine kit sat alongside the skeletons that we were doing. Mm. And the idea was that we... We were making little in inserts that would fit into a bigger a bigger plastic tool, halving the cost of the tooling, and we, it was a test to see if we could um, make that kind of tooling work commercially. Um, and we knew Space Marines would be popular. We had no idea 40k would be, but Space Marines had already proven to be very popular because of um, the LE2 miniature and the um, little set of um, space marines that Bob Naismith had designed a couple of years before. But um, when 40k actually hit the streets, it was um, probably the first time that we nearly broke the company through success rather than through failure. <laughs> <laughs> so, because it was, it was, it was insane. It was bonkers. Uh, everything sold out. Um, we had 
uh, immense pressure suddenly landed back onto the studio. So, oh, you've done a fantastic thing. Now you've all got to work 12 hour shifts to, uh, get, to get enough new 40k product out to satisfy this monster you've created. Mm. <laughs> so the, uh, the result wasn't that, uh, putting our feet up and, you know, lighting up a cigar and enjoying <laughs> ourselves. It was, it was hard work. Suddenly we had to do like real work. You know, it's like, oh no, we've got to get another supplement out. We've got to, and then Brian was banging on about army lists. We need army lists. And, and where are all the 40k models? What are you playing at Merritt? Where's the range? <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, and then so and so we were making models hand over fist and, and everybody was getting involved and Brian was telling the designers to make these mod make this model and he was coming into the studio and saying, Oh I've told, told Bob Mason to make these and I've told Ali to make those and I have to go around and check that they knew what they were doing and, and it was really, really crazy. And then we take these new designs to Rick and say, Oh, we need some rules for this. And Rick would be really grumpy because he'd say, Well, Brian told me they could put rules for those in and now we've made the models and I've got to do it. <laughs> yes. Yeah, it's really, really crazy. Um, so that was back end of the 80s. Um, the success of 40K immediately sparked our, the hardback era for that version of Citadel and Games Workshop. Um, because obviously, suddenly we had a really best selling hardback book it was like yes great <laughs> let's do more um so we did uh warhammer i can always get this always get this wrong it's warhammer third edition that's third edition isn't it hardback. yeah that book. and then um and we did um, the realms of chaos and then we did wolfrup and we did um call of cthulhu hardbacks and we started doing the rune quest hardbacks and um Basically, we were looking for anything that we could put into hardcovers, <laughs> so, <laughs> striking all these licensing deals with American companies, and yeah, that was that was kind of fun. Um, but yeah, because we we created a beast, so we had publishing more hardcovers, hardcover books, and more fantasy. Uh, I'm sorry, more 40k miniatures, hmm. and um, yeah, that was fun. <laughs> Seriously, it was, it was it was fun, but uh, but yeah, but high, very high pressured, and we made tons of mistakes, and um, some of which mattered a lot, and some of which didn't really matter. We got into trouble all the time because we kept making um, wrong turns, and you know. Um, Is but, there any uh, of those that that sort of stand out now as like an obvious? Okay, why did we? Why did we do that? <laughs> or, or have they all sort of just merged into a kind of... Uh... Kind of merges into, into yeah. time. I, I remember we, I was pretty much project managing the um, Space Hulk game. Um, so in terms of production and um, rules were being handled by the fantastic Richard Halliwell, rest in in, in peace in um he he um absolute genius games designer uh created this fantastic game and uh as it, 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 it play tested people loved playing it was great you know and uh we used to have huge meetings to talk about the terminators and the gene stealers and <laughs> and, um, and we're making them in plastic and how we're going to do it and uh, that was all great and uh, that, that, we, we got that done and Brian was very central to this whole process and then um, we, you know, and I'll get getting the floor pans done I think Gary Chalk did those mm. and dealing with him and then um, I think Space Hulk was the kind of, I think it might have been the reason why we actually Gave Dave Gallagher and Wayne England full time jobs in the studio because of the their, um, or it was around that time that they they joined full time. So that's very exciting having to you know manage their input and it was all tickety boo and then the game was finished and off and then I get a phone call from Brian and he's, he's just, um, and. Uh, I think I was in, in the office very early in the studio and he was in the factory. Obviously, copies of the 
game had landed on his desk, fresh from the factory. And he phoned me up and he told me off <laughs> and said how much I destroyed this product. And I said, why, Brian, what have I done wrong? And he said, he said, it's a closed system. It's not an open system, it's closed. And, and I was like, oh dear. So um, yeah, that's a weird one. No, never quite understood why that would have been a particular problem, but it turned out all right in the end. We sold vast quantities of it. We made loads of great supplements. But uh, Brian's upset momentarily that it wasn't uh, an open case. <laughs> so it, there weren't rules for using all the other 40k miniatures right. in it. No, I didn't want to explain to him that would have required a sort of 400 page rule book. But, uh... And of course, in White Dwarf, some of those some of those rules did turn up down the line, didn't they? And, and other, you could bring other miniatures in and, and use those as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's, it's just, I don't know, it's just the classics, sort of the ups and downs. So, uh, and that was probably our most successful board game launch since Talisman. Talisman was always number one, no matter when we ever did it. So, uh, but uh, yeah, it was it's strange times. But uh, very exciting, a roller coaster in emotions. Uh, but uh, anyway, 40k was so massively successful, um, it kind of propelled Games Workshop up, up another notch. Um, and was really the, the, the spark that set off an another period of, of, of really strong growth. Um, and I think we got to about 30 stores in the UK. And I think we had half a dozen stores in America. I think so around about that time that weren't the, the American stores weren't working out very well for reasons mm. I don't know fully. Um, but uh, obviously we'd had a massive in, influx of new staff as well during that period. So the, I don't know what the head count would have been, but it was um, I think the studio, we had about 40, maybe 50 people working in the studio at, at that time. I know, which was kind of like, what? <laughs> yeah, far cry from the well, six or seven when you first joined Citadel yeah. then. Where did all these people come from? <laughs> um, trying to work, I was trying to work it out, and then I go, oh, there's someone else in there. Maybe it wasn't quite as high as, maybe it's 40 people. I, I, anyway. It's quite a lot of people. Um, and then uh, we'd, we'd had various different studio managers. I, I kind of was never officially studio manager, although I was kind of the most senior manager in the studio for about three weeks <laughs> at one point when I first joined it. Um, but then my, my, my old pal, um, Richard Ellard, um, became studio manager. And then Richard went off to run the American business and Tom Kirby got introduced to me and he said, oh, Alan, this is Tom Kirby, he says, Brian. So, oh, hello, Mr. Kirby. He says, call me Tom. All right, Tom. And uh, yeah, Tom's going to be, uh, who'd been running, brought in to run the retail chain, um, uh, was the new studio manager. So Tom Kirby was studio manager probably round about that time, sort of 80, 87, late 87, for, for a, a little while. Uh, and um, it was Tom, and I don't, can't remember the exact sequence of, event, of events, but Tom, um, Stopped being. Uh, sorry, I'm going to get this a little bit confused. Now. Yeah. What happened was that Brian um, decided to go and um, live abroad for health reasons, um, and wanted to kind of find an exit strategy. He'd he'd um, he'd obviously organised his 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 management by her always would. Um, acquired a majority stake in Games Workshop and he wanted to um, move on, do other things. Um, he, he, uh, so it, the, 
business moved to Tom, who I don't know whether Tom became general, but, but Tom was trying to organize a, a, a management buyout. Um, and whilst that was happening, Brian had gone off to live in the Caribbean somewhere for his, to help him with his health issues. And um, uh, and, that, and Tom was running the show, so he stopped being the studio manager. And I think Rick, that was when Rick became studio manager. Yeah. And we moved the studio to Castle Boulevard. And... Um, and, that, and then it changed again. It became we became the Tom Kirby's Games Workshop, and uh, that brought about another like massive cultural shift to the business, and, and another sustained period of a different kind of growth. Um, under Brian, most of our growth had been home based. It had been in the UK, and it had been through like remote hand, um, handling of, of overseas stuff. Um, the exception being America. So we had a headquarters in Baltimore and, uh, and the fantastic Richard Edward running it. And um, Brian used to visit and spend quite a lot of time in America because obviously we recognised that he recognised the massive commercial potential of, of the US market. So he was spending a lot of time there up, up to that point. Um, but that was about the sum total of Brian's interest in the in overseas. Otherwise he was more concerned about what we were doing in the UK and 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 that US business. So when Tom took control of the business, he was convinced and proved correct that the business would work anywhere that the games workshop model would work in any country um, and so he was very interested in, in expanding not just in the UK um, and not just in the US but everywhere America uh, Canada Germany France Spain Australia wherever we could and I think we that that ambition is still in Games Workshop today. I think Games Workshop would, would, would I think even now would be looking at all the markets around the world and saying, how can we get some cash out of that place? Because mm. <laughs> we, we we assumed Tom Tom rightly um, ascertained that um, the kinds of people that wanted to buy toy soldiers from us and play war games or paint them or just store them under their bed. They're the same people around the world. Um, they, they just speak different languages, it, but it doesn't matter what race, creed, or colour they are. They, there's loads of people. They all want it everywhere around the world. And um, the only thing that obstructs that are um, um, the sort of local trading conditions. So in places where it's extraordinarily hard to open retail stores, it's you know, or expensive to do that. It's a bit difficult to get a Games Workshop store open. Um, in places where it's difficult to um, repatriate the profits, it's hard to set up a Games Workshop business. So, for example, India, it's a really difficult place to open retail stores um, because you have to open them in expensive malls if you want to, you know, sell luxury western style goods um which makes it challenging to open low-cost games workshop stores but it's really really difficult to extract profits from india because their local trading conditions make that um, mm. um a difficult thing to do so yeah but um yeah but tom's all over expanding and um pushing the business out around the world did that lead to any? Obviously, there's the the sort of translations and and moves to simplify what might be on a card, for instance, so that it can fit because you need to now do it in multiple languages and stuff like that. But did it? Did those international markets influence 
the kind of games that were getting made or the lines that were being produced or let's emphasize this particular army over another one were those kind of decisions affected not not in relationship to the internationalization of the company but in terms of the making games workshops products more accessible that they come to the same place i think so right. um we had a bit of a messy product range when um brian left the business we had i mean 40k we had it was nine or ten various supplements some of which were reprints of warhammer of white dwarf articles and it was all kind of messy and difficult and, and it was like how do i play 40k where well, you need this book this book this book and you need this thing and then you need this thing and how do i know which miniatures to buy here we haven't done a book that tells you that <laughs> so but, uh, so it was all a bit yeah tricky it was a little bit a bit difficult so one of the earliest things that um tom asked rick to do was um give me um a, give me a version of 40k and warhammer fancy battle that i can sell in a supermarket that was basically it and that was the that was the um well i don't think he said super he might have said in any shop <laughs> so um that was the the decision to go for the big box versions of the of the core games and um still works today you know they're still still happening today but the, but the but tom's goal or his his objective sorry was to have a product that he could sell anywhere mm. that was self-contained so you bought this it had miniatures in it so you could actually play with the miniatures and you could paint them and you could understand and there was a, there'll be a bit of paper in there that told you how to paint them um and uh and, and the rules and some exciting background so you you put them into context and uh and that was and it might have had a price there might have been a price objective and we need to be able to sell it for under 50 quid there might have been that i don't know for sure but um, <laughs> that was very much the brief so um uh and okay, again i get this wrong so it'll be fourth edition fantasy battle and Second edition, forty k. Yeah. Get that right. Well, um, <laughs> we didn't think in those terms at the studio. By the way, we didn't we didn't think in edition terms. We just thought, that that, what's the next one? Oh, do forty k again. Rah, right. roll sleeves up. <laughs> Stop thinking about you know Latin Latin like phrases and poetry that's based on you know old yeah anyway whatever. <laughs> so uh, yeah, so that that was that. Um, so no, Tom. Tom wanted a, a, a much more accessible product. Um, his philosophy was that that um, that any kid uh, of any anywhere in the world, any any kid, could, could, will be excited by our toy soldiers and want to play games with them or paint, them or, or just put them in boxes under their bed. Um, so why why don't we? What, what stops any kid buying our product and it's accessibility it's con having a context for it so we were it was all it was all about um making it easier to, to purchase and get into mm. it and that was the start of the army books and the codex yeah. books and things like that as well right which yeah. serves a similar purpose i guess yes and, and again we, we we um we didn't at that time i guarantee we had no thoughts in our head that we um it's okay we can slap out an empire book because it's all right in three or four years we'll be doing another one <laughs> we, didn't, we didn't have those thoughts in our heads i can assure you when we did those army books they they were permanent fixtures in the firmament this was making these were permanent statements about <laughs> about the uh, about the miniatures so uh um, in fact, the imperative to update the army books um, didn't arise as a result of updating the core rules set. So it wasn't like when we did the next version of Warhammer Fantasy Battles, we had we thought, oh, we better we now have to go make new army books for all of those armies. 
hmm. the imperative to update the army books was because we wanted to make new miniatures and um, and release new miniatures onto the market. And um, what we discovered quite early on was because the army books and the codexes were s- sort of very successful at, um, at consolidating excitement and interest in the in the miniatures that were about to be released alongside that book on they became uh, tent tent pole is that the right word tent pole releases right uh, and we found it really hard to get the internal market excited about miniatures releases that weren't accompanied with an army book or a codex so um yeah that was um, a painful lesson because we tried other ways to do it we tried other products um to uh, not make us have to do a new army book each time. Um, but those products weren't as successful and weren't perceived internally as doing that, that same job. So, yeah. yeah. Well, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because like, the, the sort of general feel is that the... <clears throat> Or it might you might one might assume that the army books is kind of right. Well, this is the catalogue of what we're going to be producing for this army for this edition, and and we sort of follow that, and and because there's a, there's almost a sense of that unbridled version of the the worlds that existed in the earlier editions of the games, where it was just we're just going to release something cool that someone thought of and just add this, and now you can have this unit or this squad. Now it's all defined in the army books or the codex. Uh, and that's kind of driving what we're we're then going to produce. But um, yeah, it sounds like there's a more of a symbiotic relationship between other different aspects of of what's being made. I guess. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think that's a good word, sim- symbiosis. Um, and so it, it's very hard to publish a book that had rules in for miniatures that you couldn't buy or didn't exist because that breaks that symbiosis in that way. And similarly, difficult to release new models that aren't in the in the army book because that mm. breaks the link the other way. And so, um, yes, massive, massive amount of pressure um, results and that gets um, released in, in internal and external criticism of the producers, i.e. AKA the studio. What are they mm. playing at? What are you playing at? <laughs> when you made, I got let. I got a letter from uh, a lovely letter one day, as uh, in the in the mid eighties. Some I got this, it was written in crayon, which was great, and it was it was from the Dark Lord, um, the Dark Lord of Nagaroth, who was who was upset because we because he was demanding his chariot. Where is my chariot? <laughs> <laughs> Where is my chariot? Mr. Merrick, you will burn in hell if you do not bring me my chariot immediately. I said, like, "Oh my gosh!" So I had it stapled <laughs> on my office office wall for a little while. It's quite fun, but that was so. Uh, yeah, I didn't know that the Dark Lord of Nakaroth had um, had crayons. With it. <laughs> so, but no, we used to get a lot of a lot of stick internally and externally. Um, if we released an army book, we didn't have the miniatures for it uh, for all of the cat all of the entries. Uh, um, and that made it really, really particularly difficult with with, with fantasy, uh, with Warhammer fantasy going forward, because the legacy ranges were huge for some of the armies, and um, of course, every time we did a new edition, we had to include all of the legacy units mm. and characters, even if we hadn't made models for them before because the expectation was people might have converted models or that or that they were in fact things that we had an ambition to make so we had this enormous um problem where with fantasy battle particularly in the initially where that legacy expectation limited how much how much new things you could put into the into the project um and um, that eventually was one of the facts that um, kind of broke fantasy. Um, it began to have 
an impact on 40k decision making when we got to third or fourth edition codexes <laughs> but uh, but nowhere near as problematic as it was with with um with with fantasy so i'll give an example in in, in 40k the eldar mm-hmm. so um, the aspect warriors were a very central part of the of the craft world eldar idea and um, Jez Goodwin made these really lovely, um, almost timeless versions of the of the Aspect Warriors right at the very beginning <laughs> of us publishing them. And I mean, it must have been 10 years later, or 15 years later, we were still effectively selling those same designs. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of the problem was that whenever we went to, to look at the Eldar range and said, oh, what are we going to do now for the Eldar? And go, well, we've still got all these legacy metal codes or resin codes that we want to turn into plastic kits. But let's face it, we can't put all of the effort this time around into doing plastic kits for all of the Aspect Warriors because that won't be as exciting as doing something new for the... And so, yeah, you can imagine. It was just difficult. I noticed recently they have started doing <laughs> plastic kits for the aspect world. Um, so it's about 20 years after after they should have done. <laughs> but there you go. Yes. Yeah, I mean, there's some long-serving Eldar troops, I think, and and Skaven as well uh, over the years when they're... <laughs> I guess it's, it's oh. a testament to Jez Goodwin's skill and, and the designs that, that uh, he was putting together. Yes. Yes. So um, well, actually, metal minute. We were selling metal miniatures that were older than many of our fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. When did you design this? Oh, about three years before you were born, Sonny. <laughs> Good thought. <laughs> so as then, so obviously that's sort of continued. Now we've got the big box starter boxes for forty k and for Warhammer Fantasy. The army books, the codexes, the ranges, sort of being refreshed and moving forward a bit. What were you doing during that period as, as sort of Tom Kirby's international expansion really took off and the, the business really started to change from what it had been in, in the Brian Ansell days? I, I was, um, through the 90s, I was I was Mr. Studio. So uh, um, and initially under working with Rick, I was, Rick was my boss, is the studio, studio manager for, um, quite a large part of that time, and then um, and then under Robin Deuce, became okay, studio manager. Sometime, sometime in the nineties, I can't remember exactly when. So, uh, but my job was really more became more and more focused on um, design, miniatures design, artwork, um, uh, layouts, and. Uh, so the look and feel and the visuals and various uh, times involved with rules and games developers. Um, so that, that was kind of my, my thing was really product, product focus. Um, but I was also um, A member of of Tom's sort of senior management group, so um, Rick and myself, and then and and then me, Rick, me, and Robin would be part of that of the broader group of people that would be looking at right across across the the whole business, mm. and we'd have these um, sometimes entertaining but mostly very dull meetings sitting in this uh, uh, very large office. HQ with all these people from factory and sales and that and different parts of the business accountants um, and they would variously give us heart and we'd have to explain what we were doing and why we were doing it and then quiz them on why they weren't selling enough of them and all that stuff and terrible bun fights and stuff um, but uh, yeah no so I was in, in doing that as well so I had a perspective on the broader business but my main my day job was was um, uh, managing designs, managing artists, managing the layout and, and stuff, and coordinating with people that were, being, you know, responsible for delivering those those things. 
Um, and that was good fun, actually, to be honest. That was a good period. Nin the 90s was, uh, was um, uh, a hoot on the whole. You know, I got to go all around the world um, to talk about products to Games Workshop staff and customers all around the world you know we, we, we had, it was a, it was a very uh, uh, entertaining and mostly positive environment to work in um, and we were you know some of the quite a large number of colleagues were uh, had been with the business for you know over, over a decade or more so we were we were a band of brothers still just about <laughs> Um, and uh, that was good fun. But of course, during the Tom Kirby period, we also started to do um, a lot more licensing. Um, so we were, there was a, again, um, it was something that Tom felt very strongly about that, that um, 40k and Warhammer and Blood Bowl and all the things that we created had a had a value beyond our market. <clears throat> and I have to be completely honest and say we didn't all subscribe to that view um, initially. And the reason is because we come from such humble beginnings and such it seemed crazy to us that you know uh, <laughs> the, this tiny little um, insular British company in the you know that had really been founded in the back end of nowhere had created something that people might want to license um, you know to do a computer game for and things like that it was all a bit of a mystery really and a bit mm. a bit kind of um, futuristic thinking but we came round to it eventually I mean so um, as, as licensing went through ups and downs and successes and failures and stuff, it, it became clear that there was a lot of a lot of um, opportunity there to um, to do um, successful things in in world in places outside of our normal market. Hmm. And I would be the one that would be dragged along to meetings with licensees or license. I'm going to get it wrong. So we're the license saw and their licensees. Right. So, uh, so I'd be dragged into meetings and say, oh, this is Mr. Warhammer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, and uh, our licensing manager would say, yes, you can ask him any question you like about Warhammer. And I'll have the answer. <laughs> <laughs> they drop me in it like that. So uh, luckily, I never got answered, asked any really difficult questions. Normally, I'll get asked things like, what a Skaven night then? <laughs> 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 you know, but uh, so I, I I became um uh a use a useful resource for the for licensing. The licensing team was three people, you know, mm. so it was very helpful for them to have. Um, and and also we didn't want them to be um just crashing into the studio and suddenly going, oh look, um, these are our, these are designers. Talk to them if you like. No, 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 don't do that. We don't like talking to the actual designers. You might upset them, or they might get them distracted, you know, um, or they might promise to do stuff that we don't want them to do, you know, because resources are scarce. And um, so we were very protective about the studio as a resource. So part of my part of my job was to act as a kind of a, a gatekeeper to, mm. to keep um, keep the, the licensing. And indeed, keep keep um, salespeople out of the studio. <laughs> <laughs> so we don't want them interfering. Is it, is it Brian, true? Brian, 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 sorry, uh, Brian Ansel always always um, maintained that the studio was, uh, was it had to be an ivory tower. It had to be uh, separate from um, sales uh, business, particularly. And the re the reason being that they they would ask it to do things that. Um, to get like a cheap uh, cheap win or something, and it would be uh, it would be too chaotic and too too random and too dangerous to allow that. Um, so don't trust salespeople. <laughs> it's like no, you have to at some point. But uh, he seemed, he was very convinced that that was part of the reason why the design studio was, for the large part, physically separated from the, from the 
the office, the head office. Um, and then even when we were all together on the same site, consolidated on the same site, um, access control limited who could go in and out of the studio. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like our secret box, you're not having. <laughs> Um, I was just going to ask you on that on that licensing question. There's there's always been rumours that, um, and you may not be able to talk about this. I don't know, but that uh, Blizzard had originally been looking to create a Warhammer PC game, which was when they ended up, and it didn't work out. So that's why they ended up creating Warcraft. Is that true that you're aware of? I have no idea. Right, <laughs> fair enough. It, it may be true. There may sure. be a grain of truth in it. I think I think well, if you got like a, a, I don't I don't know if, um, for for sure if I'm allowed to say sure no, that's all right but, but there is a, there there might there might be an element of, element of truth sure um, and then the other thing that always occurred to me around and it was a question sort of with us as fans why there was never a, a TV show or a movie set in Warhammer or, or 40k I guess in particular um, like through the 90s and the the 2000s. Is it just well, a cost uh, thing and a difficulty in kind of bringing those worlds to life? Okay. Uh, opportunity, there wasn't one because we were small, even mm. though we weren't in the hobby, in the world of hobby games, Games Workshop and Warhammer and 40K were massively significant. In the rest of the world, they weren't really. Um, the, the biggest reason is because of the way that... Um, um, me media is uh, is structured business in terms of businesses. Um, how the, how they how they're commercially structured makes it uh, different from licensing a computer game. Hmm. Um, so um, uh, we have, we had we used to get um, constant. Despite what I was saying about the size of the business, we we through the nineties, especially so uh, through the nineties, we used to get increasing numbers of of outreach um, uh, contacts from the media, you know, from uh, what what would you call it, um, moving media from TV and or movies. sure, yeah. Um, and there, and all of the opportunities were sort of along the lines of we'd like to make a 40k movie brackets scale movie brackets whatever movie um it will be really great for you it will give you fast fast amounts of publicity uh, all you have to do is give us a million pounds <laughs> sort of, of seed funding and 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 you'll make millions and go, oh, okay how will we make millions how will our one million investment turn into multiple millions then and they would say, well, because you'll get like all the all the back end merch, merch, they call it now merch, don't they? Merch sales. And we go, yeah, but we already get all the merchandising income because we make the product. So <laughs> what else do we get then? How do we do we get broadcast monies and things like that? Do we get monies from other people? And they go, oh no, no, no. Your your money comes from the that all comes in the back end on those on the on the merchandising. Just look at look at house, but um how your man you know did with Star Wars, and you go, you yeah, know, that's not that's not going to work for us because number one, if we haven't got a million pounds to get you, and number two is we kind of already own all the merchandising rights. We want to have money from the actual process itself, and that was always the the, the, the sort of essence of it. Really, was that there was never any. Um, it's not like you go to a, a, a film company and they and they go. Okay, we're excited about the opportunity. We'll give you an advance against uh, future and royalties of, you know, a couple hundred grand, you know, or anything like that. Which is actually the way that most other licensing works. So um, it's it's really that was really about the difficulty of structuring a deal. We came very very close on a couple of occasions when I was at workshop um, to striking actual real meaningful deals. But uh, they all came to nothing because of those 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 issues. I'm not sure, entirely sure what what Games Workshop are doing now. I've, I'm not privy to any of that information. But I think the the um, hook up with Henry Cavill and Netflix or Amazon or whoever it is 
I think it's Netflix, isn't it? Um, that might be quite interesting. And I've got, I have absolutely no idea how, how um, Games Workshop are, are structuring that deal. Um, but the big difference between the modern Games Workshop and the Games Workshop um, back in the day when I was there is, is that the modern Games Workshop has very, very, very deep pockets mm. because it's been making such fantastic profits. It has... Um, it has it has enough money to completely fund the production of, of a film or TV series from its own from its own bank account. Hmm. So we were never in that position. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, I wish them well. I'm, I'm, looking, I'm quite excited about what they're going to do. And, um, I'm, I'll be I'm, yeah, I'm, very intrigued. Fingers crossed that they don't. <laughs> But uh, um, yeah, I, I've, um, I've I've had to sever my deep emotional connections to Warhammer and 40k since I left the company because it's I'm, I'm not there anymore. I'm not I'm not, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not part of it anymore. Hmm. <laughs> well, I mean, on that note, so you left in 2016, I think. Is that right? Yes. Yeah. So that would have been shortly after the end times and the end of the Warhammer fantasy world. I just wondered what your sort of thoughts and, and I guess recollections from that period of decision-making, I suppose, of we're going to bring the Warhammer world to an end. We're going to take a look at creating a brand new version of the fantasy universe that we can sort of explore. Do you sort of remember how that kind of all, all kicked off and how, how that progressed from, from the, in the, I guess in the boardrooms and in the decision making spaces. Well, yes. So, it's it, if you look back at Games Workshop's um, financial re reports from sort of two thousand six, two thousand seven, that sort of period, through the the, the noughties and the and the, the teens of the new century, and um, it, it's self evident that we were we were finding it hard to get back to sustained healthy growth it was a difficult period for us and we were having to do lots of work internally to um, get some momentum back into the business and some of the structural problems we had with some of the products were beginning to become really tricky and difficult and obstructive um, um, so we were not wanting to um, get tedious talking about some of these things. So the, the, the net the net result was we needed some we needed some exciting radical um, things to do with product, and um, uh, the trend for the business internally to be focused on and excited by 40k at the expense of just about anything else had become stifling so there was a real um, point during that period of um, restructuring re um, recosting the business and and and, and re thinking the kind of core philosophy about what the product ranges could look like that there was a real risk at that point that it, that we might have to become a 40k company and i know oh, lots of lots of warhammer fans out there go oh that's typical games workshop because you just didn't invest in warhammer fantasy battles if only you'd invested in it like you did 40k everything would be fine it would be a top best-selling game just like 40k was and the answer was yeah when it wouldn't <laughs> we, we, we had done that we did look at numbers we weren't winging it um by by in, in those years we had massively sophisticated analytical tools to look look at what we've been doing and the successes and where things were working and the long sh short and tall of it was that actually you know 40k was actually remarkably healthy and um, everything else was less healthy. Now, I'll, I'll, I wouldn't go so far as to say that Warhammer Fantasy was, was 
dying. But we had a big, big problem. I talked to you earlier about the internal market and the external market. Well, the, the internal market, had, had for, for, for years, we've been fighting against um, a, 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 the sales expectations to do with the different product ranges. So, um, and, and, I, and I, in a very narrow sense, it's almost like you go, if it's a 40K month, i.e. lovely 40K releases, uh, everybody was super happy. All the sales guys, all they're really happy. They're all going to make their targets. All, all the sales managers and all the stores and all the sales departments are all cheering because they think, oh, great, we've got a chance of actually winning a bonus this, this month or of hitting our targets, and it'll be great. And nine times out of ten, they did. And so they were super happy. And then if we gave them anything else that month, if we said, well, this month is a Necromunda release, uh, an epic 40K release, a Battlefleet Gothic release, a War of the Fantasy release, anything that wasn't 40K. <laughs> and it would be, oh, it just make my job harder, says every salesperson in the company. Now, that's not literally true of every single salespeople. And there were certain stores where obviously the manager and the staff were be massively invested in the fancy battle and they'd be so excited and brilliant at the jobs anyway that they'd still smash their targets and do really well and that would be great but unfortunately that wouldn't be everybody in the company and it also wouldn't be all of our customers because funnily enough the customers had exactly the same reactions so there would be fantasy fans that would be super excited oh yeah what else this month hooray it's the best day ever it's like my birthday all come all, all my birthdays come together and but most people would be going, oh, Wood Elves, mm. why aren't you releasing Space Marines? <laughs> or <laughs> when are you going to get around to releasing those Eldar or Sisters of Battle or whatever? <laughs> so, and we tried all sorts of things. So, we tried releasing both things together. So, we said, okay, let every month we'll release something to do with 40k and something to do with something else or only 40k. And of course, what would happen then is that the factory would come back and say, why have we got these? fantasy battle things next to the war and things because we're only going to do a few of them it's getting in the way it's stopping us being able to make as many of the 40k ones as we need to fulfill all the orders and you go oh crikey so you, it was a kind of a difficult problem and it got worse as the business grew um that difference in the way that products were received got bigger and that's the end of it. That's that's really the thing that said. So what are you going to do in that circumstance is you can either decide to not do things. And we constantly had to make those decisions about specialist games through the years. And I know that gets people going to be like a bit weird about that. So what was the thinking behind the, the specialist games? Is it, well, we released the product, we sold it as much as we could, we invested in it as long as we could. And we tried to get as many people excited about it for as long as we possibly could because we want to sell as many of these as we possibly can. And then eventually the market literally says, yeah, we've, that's it now. We've got, we've got all the ones who are of those. Can you do something else now? So at that point, you have to kind of be realistic and say, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll stop doing that for a bit then. Maybe we'll come back to it later on. But it's quite hard to do that with one of your tentpole properties with fancy battle. It's a bit hard to say, okay, we'll just put it on the back burner for a couple of years. And then we'll come back to it because that's as good as killing it. Mm. Yeah, we can't do that. So um, we've been thinking about this issue with fantasy battle for a long time. Now, again, I know there'll be people out there that'll go, oh, but that's because they just didn't invest in it. Yeah, well, we did invest in it quite heavily. But unfortunately, at the end of the day, it you you have to go we need to get a return on every bit of investment and it has to be a reasonable return and it's difficult to stand in front of learned accountants and senior managers and say well we decided to spend all of our capital expenditure on these products and it's made this return rather than on those products and made five six seven eight times the return mm. it's just not you just can't it, it doesn't work commercially so um, 
we went through lots of scenarios about how we might um, revive the fortunes of the fantasy side of, of what we were doing. Um, and eventually concluded, well, we need a we need to restart it. We need to kick re kickstart it and give it new life and breathe new energy into it and do something radical and left field. And um, um, Seba, um it's it's the legacy because the legacy itself was was going to hold hold it down. It was holding us down too much. So um, there was talk about. Um, uh, doing all kinds of different things with the setting to try and introduce things or change things around. And in the end, I thought, well, I'll just take one of my, an idea I've been working on for some, for some while, for a few years, I've been working on a, an idea of the different realms and how of the chaos and how those might become um, um, uh, battlefields where heroes and villains of myth and legend walked, walked, walked the battlefields, and where your armies could be anything from the, fa the past, the present, and the future of the, fall of the Warhammer world, and totally blow away all the expectations of what could be an army, and and create an environment where you could anything that you wanted. If you wanted to have flying dwarf steamships, you could put them in there because you could say that those are from the future of the, fort, of the Warhammer world or whatever. Um, that um, was an idea I was thinking about having um, almost to do like a Warhammer fancy battle advanced or one of the battle two kind of a, 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 a sort of a possibly an epic type format mm. uh, uh, and I had kind of fleshed out the realms and what they were like and the idea was that they were like staging posts, posts between the Warhammer world and the actual realm of chaos that you got to travel through the land of Gar to get to the realm of chaos and yeah anyway Hmm. So I had this idea, I had this idea, and I thought, well, we could do that. And I said, but the problem is that people will still want their Bretonians. And you kind of go, yeah, they will still be trapped by the legacy because it still it would still mean, well, you've done well, I've done all these dwarf steam flying ships, but you still haven't done Bretonian peasant bowmen in plastic or whatever. It would I know we've done those, but uh, or whatever. When are you going to do forest goblins in plastic it's like well we're never going to do forest goblins in plastic because we'll never sell enough forest goblins in plastic to pay for tubing but yeah so it was kind of still had those legacy issues so um i put a proposal together that maybe we should just um uh give the warhammer world a, a a nice narrative conclusion and then introduce the realms as the new fantasy battle setting and that was kind of the, the that was the genus of the idea, really. That was the that's a genius, then not genius, because a lot of people obviously don't think <laughs> it's <was> genius. <laughs> and I'm well aware of the of the criticism of of, of what we did now, and I it, and I have to say, um, as as a lifelong champion of Warhammer Fantasy Battle, and I still believe it's it's a by far superior game to anything we've ever done 40k i have to say um i'm, I'm a uh, lifelong fan of warhammer fantasy battle it broke my art in some ways you know i mean actually really did it was not a an easy decision um but that was kind of the idea was let's and some people say why did you have to kill the Warhammer world, and yeah, well, you got to clean sweep. Give the designers, give all of those creative people, um, a literally a, a, a white canvas to paint something new and exciting, amazing on. And um, 
and they have. I mean, that's to be perfectly honest. It was here's the opportunity, guys, and I think the, the games workshop staff, the creative staff, the writers, and the miniature designers and artists um, have, have literally done that. I mean, they were um, creating the most astonishing fantasy miniatures. I mean, again, not to everybody's taste, but then. Um, as a, as a commercial project, it's ma- been, ended up being massively successful for Games Workshop. Did exactly what it was supposed to do, really. Um, so there, that's the potted history. <laughs> sure. I told you I'd end up being the, being the pantomime villain. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, well, yeah, it's kind of, yeah, I won't, it's, I won't it's, take credit for all of the decisions around <laughs> around <laughs> Age of Sigmar, but it was kind of my idea. Yeah, hmm. yeah, and it's it's. Obviously, it has been borne out commercially, absolutely, in terms of sales and putting Age of Sigmar maybe not on the same level as 40K, but it's certainly been very successful financially, I think, for Games Workshop, hasn't it? Um, it's interesting that you mentioned, though, that that sort of legacy and that almost the idea to do the clean break, so you kill that universe off so that you give yourself re- room as a, as a sort of creative team give you give yourselves permission to then just think outside the box instead of having to yeah. be tied down by the legacy of the Warhammer fantasy world but we find ourselves in a time now you know less than 10 years later where actually the Warhammer fantasy world is going to reemerge in some form through the the old world and that that release um and specifically the the Bretonians <laughs> you mentioned that people would still want well, their Bretonians um, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm not there anymore um, sure <laughs> so, so it's, well, they do what they do. No, I. It, there was always a thought that um, that uh, that that fancy battle would 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 never wouldn't die. It wouldn't really go away. It would just be waiting for an opportunity for it to be reborn in a mm. in a in a format which was sustainable and 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 um, and doable. And I think Games Workshop's kind of found that their way of doing that. It was there was always. Um, uh, it's kind of difficult when when you do something radical and 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 extreme in order to you know make a make a change you can't you can't do that half heartedly you have to go you have to go one hundred percent in if if you kind of go but it's okay everybody we, 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 there's a back door where you can still do your, your fancy battle you kind of all all up them just would have split split the vote if you like it would just split the attention and split the energy and it and and it still wouldn't have made people on the people that were really unhappy and upset it wouldn't have changed that their minds they'd have still been upset and unhappy in the same way that space marine fans are upset and unhappy when there's a 4k release and it's not more space marines you know because they're like well yeah i'm not that excited about tyranids because i collect space wolves and they haven't done any new space wolf characters for blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so every i one of the th- things that's apparent to me <clears throat> over all, all the years of the workshop was that um, the very character of the of the product offer, the um, getting people to really um, commit to and become uh, very uh, invested in a very specific thing, which was commercially a very successful thing to do, also comes with a you're going to leave those people in an almost permanent state of disappointment because if they're super, super, super committed and, and invested in the Eldar, they don't get a release every month. They don't get a release every year. They might get a release once every five years or three years or something. You know? And and that is a that's a that's clear that we we always had some customers that were just permanently disappointed and and permanently miserable because we weren't doing the thing that they'd fallen for, that they'd committed themselves to. Hmm. At some cases, like body and soul, you know, like really insane. I, I remember on one one con- uh, time when I was sort of representing Black Library in, in, a, in a con in America, and this guy came up to me and he, he said, uh, and this is early days of, of Black Library, he sort of said, uh, do you have any books with the old Dorothy? I went, well, not really. I've got this really, really super exciting book here about space marines, and I've got this fantastic book here about space battles. And, uh, oh, this book's really, of course, one of our best sellers. It's by Dan Adams called First and Only. It's one of our best sellers. It's an amazing book. 
Is that, is that got eld on it? Well, well, no, it's the Imperial Guard. Oh no, I can't. I, I, I can't read. It. It's like, but it's a really good book. It's only like four bucks, you know, the book. And it's like, well, yeah, but if it, I, I, I can't read it if it's not got the eld on it. And I said, yeah, you have to explain that to me. But why? It's a really great rip roaring adventure book set in forty k universe. <laughs> He said, yeah, but if I read that, I might fall out of love with the Eldar and want to collect Imperial Guard. And I went, yeah, OK, we haven't got anything for you then. I'll tell you what, though, there's some really nice Eldar models in the, in the painting cabinet over there. And he was so grateful for them, I guess, looks at the model. But that's, you know, that's, that's the thing, isn't it? I don't want to read the book, the really great book about the Imperial Guard, because it might make me not like the Eldar as much as I do. And you think, oh. <laughs> and we've all got a bit of that in us. We've got we've all got a bit of that, like oh, I I love my Marvel comics, and whenever I read a DC comic, I feel a little bit like I'm being a little <laughs> bit of a disloyal, you know. <laughs> Enjoy that Batman story quite that much because that's that's kind of a little bit of disloyalty there, you know. <laughs> Silly, isn't it? But that's a real human emotion. So yeah. Um, I, I'm I'm I, I I'm no spokesman for the for modern games workshop. Um, I, I uh, I'm interested to see what they do with the old world. Um, I, I don't think it's going to be a, a tentpole product. I, I my feeling is it is it could be a very successful um, sort of second rank product. Um, I don't suppose I, I have no idea. Maybe yeah. it could massively successful and and um and i'd have to eat, eat the hat that i'm not wearing but <laughs> but i was i was kind of surprised and not surprised that they've led with bretonians hmm. um, the, the reason i'm not surprised is because i kind of i kind of certain have a certain uh, uh a certain kind of feeling about how how the people in Games Workshop think about things, um, uh, but I, but I am a little bit surprised because I don't think they're they're the strongest commercial decision out the gate. Um, again, one of the most frustrating legacies of, of Warhammer for me back in the day was that the the human armies uh, were not the strongest commercial um, pieces of, of, War, of Warhammer. Chaos Warriors, Chaos Warriors, Elves, either colour, it doesn't matter, light ones or dark ones, um, uh, uh, Skaten, Probably quite high, but dwarves always very popular. Um, uh, the empire surprisingly um, uh, flat. Whenever we did any empire releases, it was always a bit like, hmm, why didn't we sell more of those? They're lovely models, absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous models, <laughs> and proper Warhammer. Mm. But the sales would always be a little bit disappointing. That is a surprise, uh, yeah, because you would almost see them, although there was never a sort of Space Marines of Warhammer Fantasy, it always felt, often felt, like Empire was pretty central, given its place in the story, in the in the actual literal world. They felt kind of like a way-in army, um, so you would might expect them to be a bit more successful. Yeah, yeah. One might. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 the, the one, one thing that was clear is that the armies that we always paired in the in the starter sets did always did very well for the lifetime of that starter set. Hmm. So uh, obviously, there, there have been periods where the the the, um, the top rated armies in terms of sales would have been those those armies for, for obvious reasons, but. Um, but the underlying trends were that people in playing in fantasy like to collect fantasy models. Uh, again, I could 
talk, I could wax lyrical about the difference between the, the models that people buy and the models that people like to have in their tournament armies, because they're <laughs> definitely they're definitely nowhere near the same things. <laughs> um, uh, there's a there, there's a again one of those interesting kind of in in uh, in hobby assumptions that if uh, a unit or a character or an army um, that is, is performing well in, in tournament play that somehow that translates into those must be the ones that Games Workshop is selling the most models of and it doesn't always in fact it doesn't ever seem to really correlate in any noticeable way with the sales which is quite surprising in a way yeah. you would have thought but, um, but, but the number of people that play competitively is relatively small compared to the number of people that go into games workshop stores or hobby game stores around the world or, or go online and buy miniatures. But, um, of course, that it might is. have changed in the, in the years I've not been there, I don't know. But, um, sure, yeah, and it definitely I, feels I like it. that tournament competitive world is, is ever increasing and sort of growing in importance is the sort of sense that, that I, I get, certainly. But uh, yeah, it's interesting to think more in the past maybe wasn't as influential i guess well uh, well I've, well I've, I've heard um similar um I've, I've heard similar feedback from um very successful collectible card game companies as well right that the card the cards that um the, de the decks and cards and the or the releases that are used at the uh, that appear in the in the successful decks aren't necessarily the ones that um, uh, doesn't necessarily equate to collect to, to the most collected or the most mm. purchased ones. Yeah, it's, it's interesting. interesting. Yeah, because yeah, you definitely would. I guess the sort of received wisdom would be that it it would drive that kind of thing. But I guess maybe people like the underdog or they like their. Like you say, people are very committed to the faction that they're invested in and that's taken their, they've sort of fallen in love with. So maybe that so, supersedes um, it. We, we used to have a, basically a saying that maybe gets it, we used to, used to go like something along the lines of 80% um, uh, of the time is, is painting the miniatures and 20% of the time is playing with the miniatures. And I, 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 I'm convinced that this is totally not true. And it actually is more like 80% of the time is, is owning the miniatures, having them <laughs> under your bed or in a box in your cupboard. And uh, and that's fine. That's perfectly okay. Owning miniatures is, is a huge part of the hobby. I own vast numbers of miniatures I haven't painted yet and will never paint probably. But owning miniatures is, is, is like the vast amount of hobby is owning the miniatures. A little bit of time is painting and modelling the miniatures, and then a, even a decimal amount of time is actually playing games with them, <laughs> because you you just don't. You, I mean, people want to, and they clearly plan to, and they and they and they often really like it. And some people do play mercilessly every week. They might play two whole games <laughs> of their favourite favourite war game, but. Um, but yeah, the vast majority, majority of the time is, is actually not playing games with them. And then when you think, well, about tournament play and thinking about tournament play might consume the energies of some people. But really, a lot of the customers, a lot of the fans, a lot of hobbyists, are they re is that what they're really doing? Mm. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm only a single data point, but it definitely, if you go on me as a sample, then I do support that. <laughs> that that bit of analysis there, yeah, I'm afraid to say it's definitely owning and collecting is a bigger part than certainly painting, but even playing. Uh, yeah. In my experience, um, and we all want to play more. I mean, I, 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 I yeah, I mean, it's like you know, think, oh, I never get a game of Warhammer. Or okay, well, actually, I never really wanted to play a game of 40k, but I am. Um, uh, I quite like, like playing Warhammer. Hmm. <laughs> um. 
I'm conscious that we're, we're sort of coming to the end of our time now. I just wanted to ask one final question, Alan, which was of, of the many things that you've been involved in and the many sort of successes over your time at, at GW. Is there one thing that you're particularly proud of the most or one game that was the sort of most fun to work on? Or is it is it just that actually there were so many great things to be a part of? I think the latter, really. I mean, it's... Uh, uh, um... In, in the very early years, every single product was a, was a special friend, <laughs> sometimes an irritating friend, um, but but uh, but some it was someone a, a thing that you got to know very intimately, and um, unfortunately, it all, almost always see the flaws in in the product in, in its finished form. It was all, all, almost always a um, taste of regret at the end of the day thinking oh no we mucked that up or we missed that or we could have done that but um but yeah they were all they were all special in a, in a way that in in the later years just because you do so many they, they become less special and your end of your appreciation for any, any individual product becomes way less than it, than it was. But there were certainly many highlights throughout the whole of my time at workshop. Um, I was particularly pleased with the work we did on plastic miniatures um, through that whole time, you know, having to kind of basically learn that almost off our own bat uh, um, and finding creative and interesting ways to um, adopt the technology and then refine it and, and work it. Just immensely proud of, of all that stuff we did. Um, I actually um, uh, worked on so many different products. It's, it's hard to say which, which were my favourite ones. Um, I I've got a soft spot for the old old Warhammer, um, despite you know being the, the villain. Um, sure. So, <laughs> um, and I think the the apogee of that was um, Isle of Blood. Hmm. Isle, Isle, Isle of Blood had the most it was just the most amazing product. Um, amazing plastic plastics. It was kind of that was what we had in mind. Something like that when we did fourth edition right. <laughs> in, in our minds i island of blood was what fourth edition was because um because no one had ever done it before and it was it was tech, groundbreaking in, in lots of ways um yeah those would be the, the main things regrets i have a few um but i'm not gonna talk about them too much <laughs> um <laughs> Sure. <laughs> but they're not that far away from 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 some of the gripes that that fans would have, you know. Um, uh, some products just didn't work out very well, or we didn't we didn't release them in the right way, and we didn't kind of um, we didn't we didn't realize the opportunity they had. Um, that there's two specialist games that I think fall into that category that that were big ended up being big disappointments but were and still maybe still have huge potential and one of those was Warmaster where it, we just didn't we just didn't find a way to put the the right kind of investment into into Warmaster. So um uh the, the original um, product plan was to have a big box with two plastic armies. Right. And had we done that, um, I think Lawmaster would have become much, much bigger deal than it, it turned out to be. Um, and I've I noticed that re in recently um, a company called Warlord Games um, have been releasing some epic games, American Civil War game and the Napoleonic game, which are 
fundamentally war master but with plastic armies hmm. and they they look pretty good and they're quite exciting so that was one big regret the other one was um, for a slightly different reason or related reason maybe it was inquisitor which i thought was one of our most uh texturally exciting and interesting pro pro products um and the, the original conception was that it would have a elite range of of um, very um, beautifully produced fifty four millimeter scale characters, and they would each one would be a, a miniature masterpiece. And um, yeah, we didn't quite deliver on that. <laughs> we did our best, but we didn't quite did it. We, we, we weren't quite in a position to deliver on it. <laughs> And again, the fact that we never, uh, we were not at the time in the in in the position to do to do any of those things as, as plastic kits, I think um, ultimately um, limited the the opportunity there. Mm. Well, I'd say what the reason I've slightly f focus on fixate on the plastics is because um, there was. A, a watershed moment that we had as a company come sort of 2000 ish. Um, and that was, we, we crossed the Rubicon as a company. We, we clearly went from being a company that produced really, really lovely metal miniatures with some plastic kits to becoming a company that produced really, really lovely plastic kits with some metal miniatures and it's kind of the tipping point is around about um the sort of 2000 period um the 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 warhammer edition that had the empire and the orcs in it right i can't i won't guess at the number is that fifth sixth i think sixth yeah um that um at, at that point up to that point plastic kit releases have been eh, okay it's perfectly exciting perfectly okay but not the driving element of a release after that point um the company internally and externally the, the customers started to measure releases on how many plastic kits there were mm. in in them and uh it's because this standard of the of the designs started to accelerate at that point design skill for sure part of that technology is a huge part of that but, um, um, I, I tend to measure um, the, uh, I tend to use that as a measure for for you know how developed the, the business was 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 getting so uh n nowadays it's it's un it's it's unbelievable you cannot imagine that games workshop could have a month where the only thing it released was half a dozen metal miniatures hmm. you know, it's not you just couldn't conceive of that being a successful a successful month for the company and yet actually back in the day we, that was kind of our bedrock really <laughs> i was reading about the uh the release of the steam tank um one of the later versions of the steam tank and because it was such a major release it, white dwarf for about three or four months did article after article after article about it because it was obviously this you know a big investment a lot of effort had gone into it nowadays it, it's sort of you know that would be one week's release and talked about for a week and then the next week it's another however many big releases because of the scale and the volume of the production yeah, well now who remembers the infamous giant issue of one of white dwarf one because we released the plastic kit of the giant and that's oh, it sure. <laughs> well that's the giant issue <laughs> god you got a lot of grief for that <laughs> Well, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me, Alan. It's been absolutely fascinating. Yeah, loads of loads of really interesting stuff. So thank you very much for, for oh, being you're here. Welcome. Well, and I hope people don't hold it against me too much, you know, the old uh, Age of Sigmar thing. 
<laughs> well, I think it's it's a tough one, isn't it? And like you say, there's business realities that have influenced these things, and we are all passionate and we all love these games and these worlds and maybe different decisions could have been made, but it's interesting, I think, to understand why those decisions were made, even if I don't necessarily agree with them or might have wanted a different path. It's still fascinating to sort of understand how things went, essentially. And I think that that's uh, an important part of uh, coming to terms with stuff, I suppose. Well, I'm hoping that the uh, games which will deliver with the old world and um, mm. make everybody happy again. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, fingers crossed. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alan, for spending time chatting to me and being so candid and open in your reflections, recollections and memories of your time at Games Workshop. It really was terrific to talk to you. I hope to see plenty of healthy discussion in the comments. Alan shared so many interesting stories that I'm sure there is loads that people want to talk about. Given that we did touch on the understandably still vexatious topic of the end times, though, I do just want to remind everybody to please stay civil and respectful. This is a safe space for us to have a good discussion about this stuff, to share our reflections and sure, some of our frustrations, but let's do so in as nice and constructive a way as we can. Thank you very much for watching. I am Jordan and this is Jordan Sorcery. <laughs>